So I hope you're ready for week three. We're going to talk about foundational topics today of importing and transforming data. Uh, it is where you're going to spend 80 or 90 percent of your time is trying to figure out how to get your data into the right format for your analysis, for your plotting. Uh, so I'm going to teach you uh, the tools that I rely on in uh, just about every analysis that I do. Uh, and uh, try to get you familiar with the tools that the, the Tidyverse uh, offers. So here we go, week three, importing and uh, transforming data. Uh, last week, we uh, did a deeper dive into ggplot2. We're going to continue to make plots uh, every week, so you'll build on your ggplot2 skills, and uh, today we'll think about all that prep work that goes into your plots. Uh, my plan is still for next week to think about exploratory data analysis. I've made a few changes here and there down the pipeline here. Uh, I worked in, I think we'll look at mapping, uh, spatial analysis in, uh, in week six. Um, previously, we had relational data there, but I'm going to work that in through, throughout the other sessions. Uh, so here we go, uh, importing and transforming data. Our plan today is I want to show you several methods for importing data. Um, basically, if data exists out there, we can get it uh, into R. Uh, we're going to look at a package called dplyr uh, we're gonna, and, and talk about some of the top functions in dplyr that are used for wrangling data. And our, our mar markdown goal for today is an output to a, a Tufty style handout. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. It's going to be a PDF. We've done a PDF before, but this is a, a particular style of PDF. Our plot inspiration for this week comes from the BBC. They had this uh, heat map style plot that looked at um, across countries at the most new uh, coronavirus cases. They do a couple interesting things here. So they get the data, it's plotted uh, by day, by country, but some countries have uh, subnational data that we're going to have to roll up into uh, national level data. They're also using this rolling average, so they're taking a, a rolling mean. So we have to do some data prep to get uh, a chart like this. And uh, this is our inspiration, and I'm happy to report, report after a, a little bit of uh, uh, struggle yesterday. Here's my plot. So uh, I did switch a slide. Uh, this is the original. This is the one we're going to make today. So we're going to get pretty darn close to uh, what the BBC uh, has has published. So this is our goal for today. When we open up our studio, we're going to look at a few different ways of importing data. Uh, so there's two main types, right? There's data, this is probably what you're most familiar with, there's data that are just sitting on your computer and you need to get them from some file on your computer into R. Uh, I'm going to talk about CSVs, R data, those are uh, uh, R specific files that are pretty slick in how they're uh, designed. But then maybe you have, uh, you know, uh, a sad friend who works in Stata and they need your help because they can't figure out how to analyze their data. So, I'll show you how to get Stata data into R, SPSS, SAS as well. But then we'll look at data out in the web, right? Whether it's a CSV out in the web, we've done that before in Google Sheets or, or uh, more organized into an API or disorganized uh, just on the web and you need to scrape the web to get the data you need. We'll take a brief look at uh, all of these different formats. Uh, we're not going to talk about databases today because it's a whole topic unto its own, but we're covering most of the ways that you'll encounter for needing to import your data. Uh, tidy data. Last week we uh, talked about the, the benefits of tidy data and uh, its core features. Remember that every variable forms a column. You have observations in the row and uh, uh, each type of observational unit forms its own data. So you might have data on people, data on schools, but those would be kept in different tables and then you can bring them together through these relational joins that we'll be, that we'll be talking about. So dplyr is a package that's part of uh, a suite of packages called the tidyverse and uh, there are lots of different functions in dplyr uh, the ones that i'm going to talk about the first five are the ones that most people would point to i end up using this distinct function quite a bit so i'm going to talk about it as well but these functions uh, are very smartly uh, written as verbs 
because with all of these functions, these are things we're going to do to our data. So we're going to mutate our data, we're going to select our data, we're going to filter our data, we're going to summarize our data. Right? So we're going to go through each one of these, and if you just read it as a verb in that pipeline, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that, I think dplyr will start to make sense to you. Uh, when we get into our studio today, you'll see we're going to use mutate. Mutate helps us to create new variables, right? You can overwrite existing variables or you can create a new one. So what it's showing here is I have three variables, one, two, and three, and I'm going to take a sum for each person. I'm going to mutate something here to create a new variable called total, T-O-T. Right? So I started with three variables, I'm going to use the mutate function, and I'm going to get a fourth variable. Right? So you can imagine where that's useful, you have a, uh, a bunch of items, you want to make a scale, mutate is going to help you to get there. So mutate, we're creating something new. Selecting is uh, selecting on the columns. So which variables do you want to keep in your data frame? Here we're selecting variables one and two. So select, and there's some slick features of select that make it so you don't have to type out all these variables. We could say, you know, starts with V, for instance, and it'll grab all the variables to start with V. Uh, but here we're selecting variables one and two. So we're going to pick variables based on their name with select. Filter does the opposite. It filters by rows. So if, if select worked on columns, which columns do you want? Filter works on rows. Which rows do you want to keep? You know, so this is like saying, uh, you know, we want to keep uh, uh, rows with uh, a total score uh, greater than or equal to six, right? So that's going to exclude our final column there. So if we wrote a function that said filter uh, total should be greater than or equal to or six, then we filtered out the third row just to keep the first two. So we're going to pick cases or observations or rows uh, based on their values. Summarize is going to be the function we use to take uh, multiple values, multiple rows, and we're going to take them down to single summaries. So if we were using summarize to create means, right, here we're going from three rows of data per person on each variable to just um, um, one number summaries for each variable, right? We're taking the mean of each column. Summarize is going to uh, take our data and summarize it down. Uh, and we can do that uh, by groups as well. Uh, and arrange is just a, a different word for sort, right? So you can arrange your data in ascending or descending order uh, by a number of variables uh, in your uh, data frame. And finally, the last one I'm going to talk about today and, and show you here when we open our file is distinct. Distinct is going to keep your unique values. Right, so if we look at variable one here, I have a one, a three, and a one. Well, the number of unique or distinct values are just one and three. Uh, this is really useful when I'm, uh, you know, you have duplicates in a file. You have multiple uh, people numbered one, and you have multiple observations for number three, and you just want to get some characteristic of them. You can use distinct to figure out your unique values in any uh, combination of variables. So. Uh, with that brief intro, let's open our studio and get our week three uh, file for today, our week three project. So you should see that as uh, uh, an assignment in your uh, in your in our shared workspace here. And as we've done before, remember our studio doesn't carry forward my uh, uh, pane layout. So once you get in, if you want to go to tools and global options. Remember that's tools and global options. I know for some of you it's still just probably uh, spinning up. It takes a second. But when you get in, if you go to tools and global options, oh, mine wants to restart as well. It's been a few minutes since I've been in it. So here's mine spinning up. And uh, again, if you've not downloaded our studio on your computer, uh, you'll be pleased to see when you do that this looks exactly the same on your computer uh, locally. Uh, here I was going to Tools and Global Options. And under Pane Layout, I, I've chosen to put Source here, my console on the top right. 
I've unchecked to leave everything except for history here and everything else just automatically falls into the fourth quadrant and you click OK. I'm going to click cancel because it's already how I want it. But that's how you would make your pane layout look like mine. Tools, global options, and then your pane layout. Not essential, but it, it might help you in viewing. So today our output format, we're going to use a, the tint PDF, which is part of the tint package. So a Tufty handout, if you look here, um, it's a handout that sort of characteristically of uh, sort of visualization guru uh, uh, Tufty, he has this handout format that makes uh, heavy use of margin notes, where you can put uh, footnotes, regular notes, uh, references if you want, uh, figures, and tables uh, and equations, anything you want into margins. So this is a kind of a characteristic uh, 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 Tufty style uh, handout. So we're going to do this today, but I don't like the cream background. I don't like the font. So there's a package that sort of takes the inspiration from Tufty and it's going to make a PDF that sort of suits my tastes a little bit better. But the idea is the same kind of heavy use of margin notes here. So we're going to produce something that looks like this in PDF form today. So in our setup, we see we're loading some packages, some packages you haven't seen before. So we can go ahead and everyone can run that uh, real quick. Uh, it should bring in, uh, it should load your packages. Remember, installation is something you do once. Loading is something you do every time you start a new project and open your file. Uh, our heat map comes from the, uh, the BBC today. Let me find, uh, zooms in my way here. Come on, zoom. Uh, let's see, can I, sorry, the zoom bar is blocking me from uh, getting in there. That's okay. I won't go to that right now. Um, uh, we're going to make the heat map that I uh, showed you from the, the BBC's plot. And um, uh, yes, along the way, we're going to learn how to import Wrangle and uh, tidy some data. So a uh, question to, uh, from everybody, uh, which packages do we need to load? Everything's here for you in the setup chunk. So if you just uh, hit the play button, uh, all of these packages, library, the knitter, tidyverse, read Excel, uh, Haven, all of these will load for you. So just run that chunk. Uh, you can hit play on the next one. And remember, this is we're bringing in an external graphic that's in the IMG folder. And this is the graphic. This is our inspiration that we're trying to make today. Right? We're going to make this BBC plot. And the data for today come from the Johns Hopkins. You've heard them referenced in a lot of plots because they're collating a lot of data for COVID-19. And I'm giving a link to the, uh, re their repository here. And when in Markdown, you can notice that um, putting the, what you want to become the link in brackets and then following the brackets in parentheses to actually put the URL. When we knit this file, that'll turn into a nice link uh, to the JHU data repository. Okay, so let's talk about importing data. We're going to start with local uh, local files. Uh, you just need to know two things. Uh, the type of the file so that we can find the function that's the correct one for the type of file and the file path. Um, when you first start out, you're going to get a lot of errors uh, because R is exacting when it comes to its preference for file names and paths. You know, if you put a space, if you put an extra character, if you put an uppercase letter when it needs a lowercase, it just doesn't know where to look, right? It doesn't search nearby and find it. It just either it's either there exactly or it's not. So almost is is not quite uh, good enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to see that um, I've showed you before that we can check what our working directory is with get wd and uh, it's in cloud uh, the directory project right so if you over here under files you can see that all of our files are under this root directory of project because this is the root directory and r knows that and if we know that then we can use relative links throughout the rest of our project here r knows we're in this project called project and so when we call the data we can just call it from within the folder data because it knows we're here so we can just say okay go into data and find uh, confirmed cases uh, global so I can open up data and I can find all of my files here today uh, so we'll start with CSV files we've used these before 
uh, you can go ahead and click run uh, play on this and it will bring into your environment uh, uh, df underscore csv right so it has um, 264 observations of 89 variables we've used csv files before you can go ahead and click on it it'll open it up in the viewer so we can get a sense of what we're looking at today and uh, you'll see we have uh, country level records and the only time that countries are repeated is when we have sort of province or state level data so there is no overall australia number uh, we have uh, an Australian number that is made up the, the combination of all of its provinces. So we're going to have to do a little bit of work to get an Australian number today. But otherwise, every country is here once, and you see across the top, it looks like we have dates on uh, January uh, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. So we're having daily data for every country in the number of, uh, and it's going to be the cumulative number of cases. So once a case appears, we're going to have four, 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 four until we get the next case, and then we'll tick up. So this is a, a cumulative number that's running. So CSVs, we've, we've brought these in before. Uh, there's also a file format called R data, and I said these are slick because uh, you can at any point take any of the uh, objects you have in your environment and save it to an R data file. So rather than saving files individually, Basically, think of our data as like a basket. You're saving your basket of, of objects, and then when you load that basket, all of those objects come back in. Now, you can't use this in a different uh, stats program, but if you're working in R, the R data files are really helpful to take everything in your workspace, just save it, and then bring it back in later if you wanted to for some reason. So we can click Run on this, and uh, you know it's gonna um, it's gonna bring in our uh, Oh, you know what, I think I actually cleared it out last time. So for me, it's not going to bring in uh, anything. I think I had DFCSV in it. So that won't quite show it. Uh, but we can move on to Excel. A lot of times people will share data with you that's in an Excel file. Uh, but that's easy. Um, that's easy for us to read in using the read Excel package. Um, so that's in the, so the read Excel uh, package has this read underscore Excel function where all we need to pass to it is the path to our file and the name of your sheet. You know, Excel files can have lots of different sheets, and so you could bring in specific sheets. So if I go ahead and click Run here, uh, now I have the same data set, right? I'm just copying it over. So it's, it's the same data set, but I read it in this time from our uh, Excel file here, right? So I can read in Excel files. If someone shares Excel, that's no problem. There's a package called Haven and uh, also a, a member of the, the Tidyverse here. And Haven will help you both read in, and same with Excel, you can both read data in and you can write data out to files that are in the STATA format, the DTA, uh, the SPSS, uh, or the SAS format. So if you click on uh, play here in our environment, we're gonna see that we've read in these data files that were in uh, STATA SPSS and SAS. So it's easy if somebody else is working in a different uh, program to get their data uh, into R. Now, this covers what you're probably used to doing in many cases where you have files on your computer and you need to get them in uh, into R. Everything's sort of stored locally. But, but now I'm going to talk about a few examples of where the data are not on your computer, it's out on the web somewhere. And uh, the examples we've used in previous weeks is where the data exist as a CSV file, right? So if you were to go to this link, you would just see a bunch of numbers separated by commas in somebody's repository here. And uh, so I'm just making a, uh, a object with the URL. I could have pasted it directly here if I wanted to. Um, but this is just going to, the same read CSV file uh, function we used earlier is going to um, bring our uh, DF URL in. So again, the same, uh, the same data set uh, coming in here, but it's reaching out into the web to get that data. Uh, it's more common now that people will share data via Google Sheets, and there's a great package called Google Sheets 4. It's also part of the Tidyverse. Uh, you can read and write to uh, Google Sheet files. Uh, I'm going to run this in the beginning when I loaded the package, this function called sheets dauth. 
what it means is that it's going to take away the interactive authentication that Google requires of you of signing in so that if you're just trying to get a publicly shared sheet uh, that you don't need to actually interactively sign into Google here. Um, uh, so what you see here is I'm taking the URL to the sheet. So if you can imagine a Google sheet, you click on the share button, you say it's available to everybody uh, and you grab the URL to that sheet. Well, um, I can use the read sheet function uh, from the Google Sheets 4 package and uh, it's going to take a minute so when you run this uh, it's going out to Google Sheets grabbing the data and you can see I, I, it, it brought it in just as easily as uh, the other functions. So uh, whether data are stored locally in a CSV or in the same type of format on Google Sheets it's pretty easy to get. A more advanced version of sort of going out to the web to get data would be uh, using somebody's API, an application programming interface. Uh, it's the same idea. People are sharing their data online, but what they do is they uh, organize it and they create uh, sort of a, a language that uh, your computer can then make a request to. So you have to read their documentation to figure out, well, how does their API work? And once you know what you need to specify in the API, like do you need a username, do you need a password, how would you get variables, all of those things are, you know, someone would specify in their API documentation. Uh, and then in R, there's two packages, HTTR and the JSON Lite package, uh, that would be able to go out, make the request in the format that, you know, the API requires, and then bring it bring it into R and then what we call parse it. A lot of times people use this JSON format, which is kind of a really nested and I think a confusing structure for a lot of us who are used to working in rectangles, uh, you know, co columns and rows. Uh, a JSON file doesn't look like that. Uh, but fortunately, people have created packages that uh, can parse a really complicated file into that uh, rows and columns structure that we're used to. So my point, here is only to say, uh, let's go out and uh, just get the data from somebody's API. Uh, and so next time um, you're in analysis and someone says, well, you can go ahead and grab my data through an API, come back here and uh, remember where these functions are and get started from there. It's, I, I put a, uh, a link here to StatWorks. We're going out to get their COVID data through their API. Uh, they take, APIs take a little bit longer to uh, kind of master, but uh, conceptually just know that uh, they, they do exist and, and we can uh, make these structured calls. The last type of importing from the web I want to talk about is web scraping. Uh, so um, here is, uh, let's see if I can get to it. So I have a, uh, a, a link here to a Wikipedia page, right? And so here on this Wikipedia page about the coronavirus pandemic, uh, let's say there's this table that I want. I couldn't get the data anywhere else, but uh, you know here it is in Wikipedia. Web scraping is the practice of going out to a website. There's some data here that I want, and essentially we're going to scrape it off of this website and bring it into R and organize it. So. Um, web scraping here, there's a function in the rvest package. Essentially what it's going to do is it's going to go out, uh, look at that HTML file that's making the web page, uh, bring it into R, and then there's a few functions we're going to use to get it into the right shape. Now, web scraping requires a little bit more experience in R because the data are kind of funky when it comes in and you've got to rename things, but um, the, the, the point of this one is to show that uh, it is possible with some functions that uh, are available in R to go out, scrape the web, and, uh, and get the data that we want. So here we have, um, uh, here's our data from R. We're just grabbing the, the state and the, uh, the case data. This is all coming from uh, the Wikipedia page. So not an organized file for us to download, but just data on a web page. Okay, so we're not going to talk about databases, as I said. Uh, it's, it's kind of a whole class unto its own. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a few ways that you can get data into R. 
uh, the basic principle should be if, if it exists somewhere, you can get it into R. So hopefully this file will be a good reference for you as you think about uh, later how you need to get your data into R. So let's get on to the more interesting and important part of uh, how we're going to uh, wrangle our data for today. Now, uh, we've, we've brought in a few different versions of the same uh, data here, except for the API version. Everything else is the same, you can see here. Uh, so we are going to start with our, I'm just going to use our CSV data, right? And if I click on that again, just to remind you, uh, the structure we're getting from uh, Johns Hopkins is every country appears on a row, except for some countries who, uh, there's no total for the country, the national level, but we have state or province level data that would sum up to the national level. So if we add up all the values for the Australia uh, uh, entries, the provinces, I guess it would be, uh, we would get a value for Australia. We get a latitude and longitude, which we don't really need for today. And then we have our daily cumulative case count. So for all, for all these countries so far in the first couple days of the 22nd, 23rd of January, 24th, there's no case data. And then the 26th, we have three cases here in New South Wales in Australia. So our data are very much in a wide uh, format. And one of the first things I want to do is I want to sub that subnational data, that all the data for Australia to get a national, uh, to get an Australia total. So you remember the pipe from before. Uh, we are going to start with our data and we're going to, here's our pipeline. And we're going to run this pipeline and assign whatever we create to an object called df underscore step one. So our data frame step one, let's say. I'm breaking this up into a few steps today. So we're going to run this pipeline and it's going to create an object called step one. So we start with our data, as we always should in a pipeline. Start with the data, uh, df underscore csv. And remember, we read our pipes and then. And now you see some verbs that I went over from the dplyr package, right? Uh, so select, if you remember, select is the variable, is, is the function that figures out which columns do we want. and it's intuitive. You can probably look at this and see, well, he showed me a latitude and longitude column and there's minus signs in front of it. So the select here is saying, give me all the variables in step one uh, or in my CSV file, except for latitude and longitude. And I'm just going to highlight these two rows, but not the and then, because if, if I highlight the and then and I click uh, run on this, you see R is waiting over here. It's, it's like, okay, and, and, and then what? And so it's, it's not gonna go because I didn't tell it what to do. So I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to hit escape uh, on this, which my escape button is hidden because I'm recording. Let me see how to do that. Oh, on a Mac, my, uh, <laughs> my escape button is totally hidden because my record button is there. Let's see. There we go. I think that works. There we go. So uh, I've escaped out of that. So let me run it again, but without the and then, without the pipe on the end of it. And you're going to see what it does is here's my here's my uh, snapshot of my data frame, right? And if I click over, uh, well, I can see I, I don't have those latitude and longitude variables anymore. Um, select is also cool because I could use some helper functions like uh, starts with. So I'm going to copy this, and instead of saying select those, let's say I wanted to get all the uh, variables that started with that X, like all those case by day variables. Instead, I could say starts with and X. And if I do this, I would, I'd be telling it, give me all the columns, all the variable names that start with an X. And you can see here it's printing for me a quick summary of all of my whole data file but notice that the only variables I have start with an X, right? So I can use helper functions like start with uh, to avoid having to type out all the variables that I do or I don't want. 
And in this case, it's just easier for me to type out that I don't want the latitude or longitude variables. Now, the next thing I need to do is um, I, I know I need to, uh, for some countries, not all of them, I need to uh, come up with a daily sum of all of their provinces. So this is where I'm going to use this group by function, which is what, not one I talked about, uh, but it's useful for all of these uh, other verbs. Group by is saying, I want to do something at the country level. So everything else that comes after group by, until I tell it to ungroup, R is going to know that I mean I want you to do this at the country region level, which is this variable for country, right? So R, I'm going to have you do some things coming after this. Uh, right now, if I just run this, it doesn't do anything new aside from get rid of latitude and longitude. It's just prepping R to know that whatever comes next, I want it to do by groups. And uh, I told you about mutate. That's where I'm going to create a new variable. And I'm going to use a special version of mutate, of mutate at, where um, I'm going to take all the variables that starts with X, right? So if I look across, remember that's all my uh, case data by day. I want to say take all of all of those day variables and I want you to do a function. I want you to sum the data. But remember, I want you to do it by country and region. So if a country only appears once, it's just going to return the same value for it. But if a country appears multiple times like uh, Australia does, it's going to sum across all of those provinces for every day to give me a value. So I'm going to go ahead and run this part. And what you're going to see uh, is uh, the data for Australia. We see we're looking at two provinces down here at the bottom. Now you're going to see it has the uh, the same value. Remember, these last two at the bottom are two, are two the first two provinces in Australia. Uh, notice they all have the same values because I've summed across them. So now by group, Australia has, this is now the sum of all of Australia's provinces and every province has the same entry. Well, because they all have the same entry, I don't need them all anymore. I just need one for Australia. So I'm going to ungroup my data. And this is a tricky thing. Once you group, when you're done doing things by group, you need to ungroup. And I'm going to use the other function I talked about called distinct, where it's going to only keep uh, one value per uh, country region. Now, I, we just did something by country, and uh, Australia had multiple values. Now, every value for Australia is exactly the same. So we're going to keep, um, uh, we're going to make it distinct by country region. So we only need one Australia, and we're going to get rid of this province state uh, variable because we don't need it anymore. So when I run this, now we got rid of province state. Australia, uh, that's Austria below it. Australia only appears once, right? And because all the records for Australia were now identical, we just got rid of the other ones and we decided to keep the rest of our variables with this keep uh, all uh, true uh, parameter. If we didn't, if we hadn't run that, if we had just said, um, let me copy this and paste it over here for a moment. If we got rid of this keep all, what it would have done is it would have said, oh, you want me to tell you how many unique countries you have. And it would have given me a list of the unique countries. But what I really wanted is all of my data, keep all. I wanted all my data, but only for unique values of country. So if you run the whole thing together, now I get a new data frame called uh, uh, df underscore step one. And here in my environment, it's now 185 observations. So one row per country. Um, and I've summed up my provinces to make national level data. And I've got uh, 86 variables. So essentially country and uh, all of my days. So it would be uh, 85 days worth of data. Okay. So in my first step, uh, I needed to sum that subnational data to get the national totals. Uh, and but last week we realized that we need to be. Um, I'm going to show you again what this looks like. Uh, we need to be working in a long format. 
so here's a wide format, right? This is not tidy in the sense that um, uh, I have values in every column for day. To make this tidy, I'm going to put it in a long format, which is going to make it easier for other analyses and plotting, where um, instead of having a country only appear once, it's going to appear every time for a day value. So we're going to take it from this wide format and put it in the long format. That's our next step. Again, I'm artificially breaking these steps up for you uh, just to make it a little bit easier. So we're going to start with the thing we finished with. We just created underscore step one. So we're going to start with that. We're going to create a pipe. We're going to do some things. And we're going to take the output of that and save it to step two. Okay, so we're starting with step one. And then we're going to do some things. And the whole lot of it is going to be saved to step two. Now, what we're doing is we're going to use a function that's um, saying pivot longer. So imagine we have this wide format and pivot longer is going to turn it this way, right? So what we want to do is we want to take all of our uh, variables that represent uh, the uh, day values, our case, our daily case cumulative sum here, right? The January 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, we want to take all of those variables. So again, in select, we can say starts with X. That's going to give me all of my data. I could have also said, um, instead of starts with X, I could have said minus uh, country region, right? It would have said, give me all of the columns except country region. But instead, I'm just showing you starts with. So I'm saying all the variables that start with X. And I want to put the, the, the headings, the variable names, those dates, I want to put those into a, uh, a variable called date. And um, I'm going to put the values that are in those dates into a va variable called cases. So I'm going to take everything up here, my actual dates, and I'm going to, in a long format, create a, a variable called date. And then for all the values, um, these are cases, so I'm going to take all of those and put them in a variable called cases. So when I, uh, when I run part of this, I'll run this first part here so you can see it. Now Afghanistan appears multiple times, once per each date, and its case and the value for those days for Afghanistan appear in a variable called cases. So I can click through here. Afghanistan doesn't have its first case until uh, February 25th. And then these are cumulative. So on the 26th, sorry, on the 24th, on the 25th, it's also still one. And it doesn't get its next case until uh, March 8th, right? It got three more cases. So now the cumulative count is four, right? And it keeps going that way. Um, and uh, the last thing I'm going to do in this pipeline, if you notice here, date is a character value. Right? It's a character format that R doesn't know that this is a date yet. I've called the variable named date, but R is telling me it thinks it's a string of uh, characters. So I'm going to use our mutate function to um, re replace what's in date um, with a function that's going to say, hey, this is actually a, a, a proper date in month, day, year format, and I want you to recognize it as a date. So when I run all of this, if you notice what's changed is R now sees this date column as a proper date. So when I do my plotting, um, it recognizes that as a, as a proper date. So I can go ahead and run the whole thing. And now in my environment, I have you know DF underscore S2. And wow, we've really exploded here. We took this wide uh, 185 observations, countries, by 86 uh, columns, so 80, 85 dates. And we've essentially turned that into a long format where those 85 uh, appear for every single country. So that's how we get a lot of observations, 15,000 uh, observations here. Uh, it's hard to hit all the, uh, monitor all the questions in the chat. I do see one about the, the, um, uh, the double colons here. Uh, you don't need it. Uh, except for I'm trying to show you a few places here where some of the packages come, sorry, where the functions come from. And this glimpse function comes from the Tibble package. So I'm just making it really explicit. If you've loaded Tibble, you don't need to do this. Um, 
But I didn't load Tibble and I wanted to show you that glimpse, the function, comes from Tibble, the package. So anytime you want to be clear about where your functions come from, uh, you can write the package name and then the um, uh, colons. Okay, so we grabbed our data, we summarized from uh, subnational up to national, we took our Y data file, and we've made it long, so now we're going to start with this uh, df underscore two, right? We're gonna start with this um, long data file, which I'll show here, right? Afghanistan by dates and its cases, and then moving on to whatever comes next, Albania, all the dates, all the cases, and uh, so forth, Algeria, and, and so forth. So we're gonna start with that. And then we're going to do some things. And we're gonna take the output of this pipe and assign it to step three. Again, I'm breaking this up artificially, but uh, the output of this pipe is going to uh, go to S3. So um, we need to calculate our daily uh, new cases. Um, for one thing, our plot, if you remember from the BBC, only includes 20 countries. Here we have um, uh, 185 countries. We don't need all of those countries in our plot. So <clears throat> for down the road, we're going to come up with the, um, the, the plot is showing the countries with the most number of cases by the end of the period. So we need to calculate uh, uh, a variable that it's going to calculate for us the max number of cases that every country has. The other thing we need to do, if you look here, uh, I've been showing you that um, it's not that Albania on the 14th of uh, April had 475 cases and then they had another 494 the next day. This is a cumulative count, right? So um, on the 14th, they had 475 total and then they added a few more on the 15th to get up to 494. But what that plot is showing us, if I scroll back here to not make you sick here, is that the, the numbers kind of go up and down, right? Uh, the bars here are how many cases. And here you have China, for instance, that starts out really high and then gets really low. So you can see there, that we're not looking at a cumulative count in China. Otherwise, at the end of the time period, China would be pretty dark, right? Uh, but it's dark here and then it tapers off. So on all of these days, China's having fewer cases per day than it had in the beginning. But our data right now are in the cumulative form. So we know that we need to go in and somehow figure out, well, give me the daily new case count, not the cumulative case count. So we're gonna do that in this uh, step here, uh, daily new cases. Uh, so our mutate function, remember, is creating something new. So we're gonna create a new variable called total, and we're gonna create a, a variable called new cases, where essentially it's just gonna look at the difference between today's total cumulative and yesterday's total cumulative, and it's gonna calculate for us what the additional, uh, what the day added. Now remember, we need to do this by country. In a long format, we often need to, we don't want to come up with the total number of cases for all countries in the world. We wanna do all of these operations by country. So we get for Albania, what was their max total? And for Albania, what was their new case count every day? So we're gonna use that group by function to say group by um, uh, country and region. Uh, and then we're gonna mutate to get our new variables. So if we go ahead and run this, you're gonna see now that uh, we've added two new variables, right? Before we only had country, region, date, and cases. Now for Afghanistan, at the end of its series, Afghanistan ended up with uh, 784, uh, let's see what we get to the end of Afghanistan. Oh, I think I've passed it. Uh, but the max value for Afghanistan was 784. So in my total variable, that's what it's reflecting just for all of Afghanistan. I just need that for the plot later. And then you can see um, the, the case count here. If you look in new cases, as I kind of tick forward in time, um, <clears throat> it was on the February 24th that Afghanistan had its first case. So in the cumulative count, it just stays at one and there were no new cases for the next few days. And then for Afghanistan, we see its next new case was on March 8th. So now we have a variable that's actually gonna plot the data we want to say, 
by country, by day, how many cases uh, existed. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this chunk and it's gonna give us a new output, uh, DF underscore three. So we have a new little mini data set here, um, Afghanistan by date, uh, cumulative number of cases, and the new cases per day, right? So this is exactly what I want, and I'm gonna really uh, be plotting this new cases number. Now, in, in that plot from the BBC, they're only showing the top 20 countries in terms of total their cumulative cases at the end of uh, the period in April. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a pipeline where we take the output and we're gonna assign it to an object called top 20. And what I wanna do is I wanna take the data frame we just came up with and I wanna figure out which countries have the highest total, which is in our total column, uh, and it's the same for every country. So which country has the, the are in the top 20 most uh, uh, countries for in terms of cases? So I'm gonna use that distinct function again. Remember the, um, I'm gonna keep all the variables, but while I'm interested in total, um, uh, the uh, I, I only need I only need one copy per country, right? Because Afghanistan and on my total variable, it's all the same. So I just need one value for Afghanistan. And when I click run here, that's what it's going to do. Now Afghanistan only appears once, and here's my number 784, which I need. We're going to use the filter variable, right? Remember, filters aren't working on the rows. Select is on the columns, filters on the rows. And for whatever reason, I didn't really dig into it, the BBC plot doesn't show the data for France. They have a note that say they, they got rid of the data for France. So I'm gonna run this and um, I'm gonna get rid of, uh, I'm gonna get rid of France with this. So now France does not appear in my, uh, in my data. I'm also looking for the top 20, so I need to arrange my data and I need to arrange it in descending order on this total variable, right? So I wanna figure out what are the most, uh, the 20 most highest uh, countries in terms of cases. So when I run that, you can see, of course, the US is on top here, uh, the total number of cases over this period, followed by Spain, Italy, Germany, UK, right? Uh, so now this is what I want, but I only want the top 20. This is showing one of 10, but all 184 are still in here. And so I can use my uh, slice, function, which is a fun one I don't use too often, but it's perfect in this case. Uh, the verbs are great. It's slicing my data, right? I'm going to say I only want the records 1 to 20. I've sorted them in descending order, so I know that if I look for the top 20, here's the top 10, here's the rest, the 11 to 20. Slice is going to say, give me everything Sweden and up, right? Give me observations, my rows 1 to 20, right? So now when I run that, uh, you can see that my data set only includes 20 rows and it's those top 20 in order. So I can run this and I can get a little data frame called top 20. And it's exactly what I just showed you uh, in the order from uh, the US all the way down to Sweden uh, because these are the top 20 uh, highest cased countries. Now in the plot, the graph we were looking at, they did something called a rolling mean. And you'd use a rolling mean when uh, your data can be spiky by day. Um, if we go back to the sort of the new cases per day, here's Afghanistan. We have one here, three, then one, then two, then four, uh, then 16. We have a graph that ends up being a little spiky. So what a rolling, what all these rolling functions do is they say that you look at a period, a window of data, and you do something to it. So what we're going to do, because this is what the BBC did, was uh, every observation, we're gonna calculate a mean that includes a window of three days. So rather than plot 16, we're gonna plot the mean of you know, 16, 0, 34. And then we're gonna plot the mean of 0, 34, 10. And then it's gonna be the mean of 34, 10, 10. And then 10, 10, 16. And then 10, 16, 0, right? So it's gonna go through your data set and whatever window we specify, and we're gonna say three days, it's gonna every, for every three day window, moving down one at a time, it's gonna calculate the mean. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna smooth out the data a little bit. You could have said, give me a seven day window. So it would take the mean of uh, all seven, then it would move down and do the next seven, and then the next seven. But we're gonna follow the BBC, and we're gonna make a window of three. 
And there's this function rollify in the tibble time package, which is nice because it lets us create a function that will um, roll our means with a window of three. So we're gonna start with what we ended with uh, before we did the top 20, which was this step three, right? And <clears throat> we're going to use a, a new uh, command you haven't seen before, this in uh, uh, command. And what we wanna do is we wanna limit our data because S3, remember, has all of our data. Afghanistan, all of our data are in here, all of our countries. But we only want to look at the countries who appear in the top 20 data set. So what this is saying is start with all of my countries and filter to only include the countries that are in uh, my top 20 data set according to the variable country region. This is, uh, if you learn base R first, you learn a lot about the dollar sign. This is just saying in the data set top 20, look at the variable country region. Data set dollar sign tells you now look in the variable. So in top 20, there's a variable country region. So in my data set S3, I have my country regions. In my top 20, I also have country regions. So it's only gonna say, only keep this country if it exists in this top 20 list, right? So if I do that, you'll see that I'll get my data down to uh, Austria was in my top 20. So I have all of Austria's data and so forth. Uh, after Austria, Belgium, right? Belgium is in my top 20. Now we need to do something by country region, right? We're gonna need to do that rolling mean. We don't wanna do it across all countries. We wanna do it within Austria, within Belgium. We wanna take that rolling mean of, uh, turn every sort of data point into the mean of the three days and, and move down the row. So we're going to do a group by, to say do it by group, uh, do it by country. And we're gonna make a new variable called cases roll. And we're going to use this function called roll mean that's gonna take our new case data and do the rolling mean, right? So when I do this, and I run this so you can see it. Um, oh, I didn't run my function. So it doesn't know what that, I have to run my function first. So now I have a function called roll mean. And I'm going to uh, make a new variable called cases roll. And now I have a new variable called cases roll. Now you notice that the first two values, values for every country are zero because it didn't have enough data. It didn't have three days worth of data on the first observation. On the second observation, it did not have three days worth of data. But finally, by the third day, um, it could look back over the first three days and the mean of zero, zero, zero is zero, right? So this isn't very informative for the first uh, few days for Austria. But then we see when the first case comes along, it's averaging two and zero and zero to get 0.6 and then zero, two, and zero to get the same thing. And then one, zero, and two to get a mean of one, right? So by country, it's looking at that three-day window to give me the, the new variable that I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And it's giving me my step four data, right? So now uh, I have a smaller data set because I'm only looking at the top 20 countries. I still have data by day, um, and I have my, uh, my rolling mean. Now, what I've also done is I've used a, this is, this is what I needed for my plot. I, I basically put them into bins. If you remember the, uh, the original plot, it looks at it by, um, you know, zero. Then it bins it between one and 10 cases, 11 and 50 cases, 51 and 100 cases. And the way that I found was best to do this was to recreate those bins. So basically I did a little function to say, if it's zero, put it in the zero to one bin. Uh, you know, if it's uh, between one and 10, so here it's 2.3, put it in the one to 10 bin. So I'm taking all of my continuous variable uh, data and I'm putting it into these bins for, for plotting because that's what the BBC did, right? So I'm taking my data and I'm putting it into figuring out which bin it falls in. Okay, so now uh, I'm ready with my uh, data frame S4, this final thing that I created here, it gives me my cases uh, in the bins uh, and it has my countries and it has my dates. That's what I need. And <clears throat> uh, ggplot, I'm calling the ggplot function. I'm saying start with my data 
right? Uh, underscore four. And on the X axis are gonna be my dates. And on the Y axis are gonna be my countries. But I had to do something that you haven't seen before. I need to reorder it by the total. If I don't do reorder by the total, it's just gonna give me an alphabetic list, I believe, of countries. Uh, but I wanna sort the countries so the US is on top because they've had the most cases. So this reorder function tells ggplot to do that. <clears throat> and uh, I'm creating a heat map today. And the closest thing I can get in ggplot to that is uh, a geom called geom underscore tile. And I'm going to fill the color of my tiles on the basis of which uh, bin a country falls in on a particular day uh, uh, in terms of cases. So <clears throat> for time, I'm not gonna go through these. These are things you saw in the previous class and you just need to see more graphs that use um, theme specifications to go in and kind of tweak with the graph until you get it to look like you want. For instance, this legend position, for 20 minutes I fiddled until it looked right. Um, and I got really close and then had to ask for help online uh, because I did not know that there was such a thing called legend key width, right? I had everything else, but I couldn't get, quit the, get the legend to look like the BBCs. And then somebody helped me online with that. And I'll give the link to where I asked that question. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this because my data are now in the right format and I'm telling it to uh, create um, uh, the tiles, uh, I'm specifying a little bit what, what the plot should look like. I'm giving the breaks for the dates to look like the BBC. They, they broke it at um, February 14th, March 5th, the 25th, the 14th. Um, uh, I found the colors that they were using just by using a hex color lookup. So I'm mapping all of the bins to the colors that the BBC used. And all of those bins have these labels to them, right? That's how they, uh, they divide them up. And then I gave it a title and a subtitle and a caption just to match what the BBC has. And if you notice, I'm actually saving the plot to a file here in our file system. Uh, so it, it saved here uh, because I couldn't quite get it to output uh, the way I wanted it to. So instead, I saved it to a file where I know it looks exactly how I want. And then I'm going to bring it in here. So when I run this final chunk, you see it's calling in the file that I created. It created this image file. Um, and this is pretty darn close to what the BBC created. And uh, for the final reveal, you can click knit. And it should for you go through, put this all together in a Tufty style layout, which is a pretty stick, slick layout. Uh, I've started to use, I write my book in a format that uses Tufty style because I like the idea of margin notes. So hopefully you're getting something that looks like, uh, looks like this. Right here I have a margin figure just showing the original BBC plot. Uh, all of those uh, hyperlinks have now, uh, from my markdown style, have turned into active links. My headings, introduction, importing data. Uh, I had a footnote here that turned into a margin uh, footnote. I'm showing uh, just some of the data, some, some of the code in each chunk here, right? This is where we went through the importing uh, data. And then I'm going through and uh, showing all of the steps in the interim little, little snapshot of the data sets that I'm getting when I create DF underscore one. And all the way at the end, you should see your, uh, your nice plot here. So uh, big lessons for today. Uh, again, if the data exists, you can get it into R, whether it's on somebody else's computer or somewhere on the web. It's either on a, on a file that you can download directly, it's in an API which you can query, it's in a database that you can query, which we didn't go over today, or it's just on the web and you can scrape it. Uh, in R, you're gonna spend most of your time for this plot getting the data ready. Again, the theme as we saw last week, Data are often stored and collected in a wide format, but we need it in a long format. And along the way, we had to do some selection to get rid of some columns. We had to do some uh, filtering to get rid of some rows. We did some mutating to create some new variables, right? Because we needed a uh, sum, uh, uh, and we used our group by to say we wanted to do these functions. We wanted to create new variables by country, right? And we used distinct 
to say, well, after we have multiple copies for a country, we don't need all of those copies. Um, and we arrange the data to go from highest to lowest. And we use that slice function to say, give me the, give me the top 20. Over and over again, those, those six dplyr functions that I uh, showed to you today, if you practice with those, that's what I use 95% of the time. And then every once in a while, I have to figure out, well, what's the function I would use to create a rolling mean? I don't often do that, um, but I, I'm going to stick it into the mutate step. I know I, I want to do something that creates this rolling mean, not just a regular mean. Um, so I'll, I'll go online and figure out how I do that in particular. Um, <clears throat> I should show you, uh, before we wrap up, uh, here's where I asked uh, the... Um, let me go into the questions that I asked. I asked one question. I'm trying to replicate this figure from the BBC. Um, here's the figure from the BBC. And I shared the code that I had come up with uh, so far. And people on the internet, and here's what I, the plot that I had, um, people on the internet were like, oh, let me solve your problem for you. Uh, and people love solving a problem. They love helping each other out. And so here someone came in, <clears throat> uh, uh, DC37, user DC37, and showed me uh, kind of that one piece I needed to answer my question, and then kind of went above and beyond and said, hey, I would actually do this to make your legend look a little bit more like the original, and a few other people had uh, ideas as well. Anytime you kind of toil for more than, uh, I don't know, an hour or two on something, if you can make a reproducible example, right? Someone could, uh, <clears throat> they could see what I was seeing on my computer. I'm not sharing any you know, private data here, uh, if you are, you need to make a toy data example. But here I'm just showing what I have so far, and uh, people within uh, 20 minutes help me push it uh, over the finish line. So that's what I have for you for today. Uh, hope you uh, hope you're able to follow along. I'll post the video, and so you can go back through it and, and maybe work through some of the. Uh, uh, issues they had. I'm going to stay on the line. Uh, if anybody has questions now, I'll take a peek through the, the chat and maybe uh, answer some chats via via Piazza. But hope you all have a, a, a nice weekend uh, and stay safe.